Would you bow in a moment of prayer? We thank you, God. Because you loved us, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Tonight, we thank you for the way that you have already blessed us on this day. Thank you for ministering to us through the music. Thank you for speaking to us through the songs. Now at the preaching moment, God, we ask that you would minister through the message, speak through the sermon. Somebody needs to hear from you. Do it and we will give you the glory, honor, and praise and all the people of God together will say, Amen. As you have your seats, in the presence of the Lord first, I want to thank President Michael Jenkins of Louisville Seminary, our host, our friend and brother, the Reverend Dr. F. Bruce Williams, Dr. Lewis Brogdon for his kind invitation, Dr. Strelba Alexander, who we not only thank but congratulate on her award tonight and on her work on behalf, not only of Black Pentecostalism, but of the Black Church. Reverend Mumford. Reverend Dr. James Heather Ferguson. To the congregation of the Bates Memorial Church and to this awesome ministry of music, thank you for the way you already blessed us. To the faculty, the administration, the students, and alumni of Louisville, thank you for this kind invitation. You have heard the scripture read for you from the 15th chapter of Luke, the sermonic spotlight for tonight's message is focused on the first eight verses of the 15th chapter of Luke. But the scriptural screen against which this passage is painted, the screen against which this passage is projected is the song, the song written by David, the song that is loved by millions, the song most of you know from its 17th century English translation from the Hebrew, or more specifically from Jerome's Vulgate Latin translation of the 23rd Psalm. Those of you who know that from memory, come on and say it along with me. It is the backdrop for tonight's text, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd. In Luke 15, verse 4, Jesus says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I want you to pray with me tonight on the theme, the good shepherd. Luke 15 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible that there is for church folk. Say church folk. Turn to your neighbor and say church folk. Luke tells us in tonight's passage that Jesus was talking. Look at verse 1, Luke 15, verse 1. Tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Jesus was talking. 
And there was something about the way that Jesus talked that was very different from the way that other men talked. Jesus, you remember, went by the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus one day, and all he was doing was talking, but Mary could not leave the room. Mary could not pull herself away from his presence. Martha was in the kitchen cooking and fussing, but Mary was in the front room listening and fascinated. Mary was hanging on to every word that came out of his mouth because there was something about the way that Jesus talked that was very different from the way that other men talked. Jesus stopped by Zacchaeus' house one day in Luke the 19th chapter. No, as a matter of fact, Jesus stopped at the foot of a sycamore tree one day. The tree that Zacchaeus had climbed up to catch a glimpse of this man that everybody was gossiping about. Folks had come into Zacchaeus' tax office to pay their taxes, and all they were excited about was Jesus. Jesus had healed a man with a withered hand. Jesus had healed a woman with a 12-year-old incurable case of hemorrhaging. Jesus had intercepted and interrupted a funeral procession on his way to the cemetery outside of the city of Nain and brought a widow's only son back to life. Jesus had touched a woman, been over for 18 years, straightened out her messed up situation. Everybody was gossiping about Jesus as Zacchaeus wanted to see him. So Zacchaeus, who was a short man, climbed up a sycamore tree to see for himself this man that everybody was gossiping about. Only instead of him seeing Jesus, Jesus saw him. Called him by name and told him, I need to go to your house today because there's some important things I want to talk to you about. And whatever it was that Jesus said, while he was talking, called Zacchaeus a rich man to give half of everything he owned to the poor. You won't hear this passage preached on Wall Street. You, you won't hear this scripture exegeted in the comfortable pews of the rich folk, the greedy folk, and the tea party praises. Whatever it was Jesus said, while he was talking, caused Zacchaeus to pay back all the folk he had cheated to get rich. Listen, four times what he had stolen from him. That is called restorative justice. Restoring the stuff that the greedy stole from the needy. It is also called repaying the folk who got ripped off. Repaying, that's another word for reparation. That is what Zacchaeus engaged in after he was engaged by Jesus in a private one-on-one -on -one com candid conversation one day in the city of Jericho. Jesus just talked to him. I'm telling you, there was something about the way that Jesus talked that was very different from the way that other men talked. You remember that story in John 8 where they dragged a woman caught in the very act of adultery? before Jesus and reminded Jesus of what the law of Moses said was supposed to be done to her because of what she had done to her husband. And all Jesus did was talk. He, he wrote on the ground at first. And when they kept on pushing him, he stood up and started talking. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to cast or to throw a stone at her. There was something about the way that Jesus talked that was different from the way that other men talked. The word of God in John 8 says that when the scribes and Pharisees, y'all know who that is? Church folk. Turn back to your neighbor and say, church folk. The text says when the church folk heard what Jesus had to say, they went away one by one, beginning with the oldest ones. We are always quick to condemn what somebody else is doing while developing amnesia when it comes to what we have done and to what some of us are still doing. Hello? Jesus bent back down, kept on writing on the ground, and when all the church folk were gone, 
Jesus stood up and just talked to the woman. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There was something about the way that Jesus talked. It was very different from the way that other men talked. Jesus started talking to a Samaritan woman one afternoon by Jacob's well in the city of Sychar, and he changed her whole life. She forgot why she came to the well, left her bucket, ran back to the city, told the people, come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. There was something about the way that Jesus talked that was very different from the way that other men talked. Mark says that when Jesus went to Capernaum, Mark 1, verse 21, he went into the church and started talking. And those who gathered for worship were astounded because of the way he talked. He taught as not one like the scribes, he taught as one having authority. Something about the way he taught, even his own enemies. In John, the seventh chapter, when they came to arrest Jesus, walked up on him while he was talking. And they decided that what they were hearing had far more validity than the stupidity that had caused them to be sent to lock him up in the first place. So they went back empty-handed, and when they got back empty-handed, John 7 says that the chief priests and Pharisees, who's that? When the church folks saw that he was, they were empty, they asked, well, why didn't you bring him? And his own enemies paid him the highest compliment. They said, never a man spake like this man. Something about the way that Jesus talked that was very different from the way that other men talk. And here in tonight's text in Luke 15, Luke says that Jesus was talking and some tax collectors and sinners came near to listen to him. Now, just as an aside, Dr. Mumford, this is an aside, I find it fascinating that whatever it was that the Pharisees had to say on a regular basis, these tax collectors and sinners did not come near to listen to them. Whatever it was that the scribes had to say, Mark said he didn't talk like a scribe. Whatever it was that the scribes had to say, these tax collectors and sinners did not come near to listen to them. Maybe, maybe there is a lesson right there. Maybe what church folk got to say ain't what people in need of help need to hear. Maybe what church folk got to say ain't what folk who are marginalized need to hear. Maybe what church folk got to say you can't wear pants, ladies, in other church. Maybe what church folk got to say if you're going to be in Ursha, you got to be in uniform. Maybe what church folk got to say when you're saved, your skirt comes below your knee. Maybe what church folk got to say when you got the Holy Ghost, you don't go to the movies, you don't listen to Jay-Z, Kanye West, Beyonce, or Rihanna. Maybe what church folk got to say, you ain't really saved unless you're speaking in tongues. Maybe what church folk got to say, slavery was ordained of God, white supremacy is God's will, the Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization, that's why we burn a cross. Maybe what church folk got to say, the Southern Baptists, why are you worshiping tonight? Say that women should stay in their place, be barefooted in the winter, pregnant in the summer, subservient to her mate, and silent unless she's spoken to. Maybe what church folk got to say. Ten years ago, Jerry Falwell, leading church person, said that the World Trade Center was demolished because of gays, lesbians, and the American Civil Liberties Union. That's church folk talking. When the levees broke in New Orleans, leading Leading church folks said on television that it was God's punishment on a sin-filled city. When the earthquake hit Haiti, right-wing Christian church folks said it was because the Africans made a pact with the devil back in the 1780s. 
I wonder what the church folk won't say now that the earthquake done hit Japan. Church folk, church folk, church folks say that Africans were property. Church folk say that Africans are born to be slaves in perpetuity. What church folk say is insane. What church folk say is insensitive. What church folk say so many times is stuck on stupid. Maybe church folk just ought to shut up and listen to Jesus. Look at verse 2. When the folk who needed the most what the Lord had to offer came to the church, the church folk got upset. That still happens too, don't it? Look at the text. The text says the church folk started grumbling. This is precisely what Dr. Miles Jones former professor of homiletics at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology of Virginia Union. Miles Jones used to teach us at Virginia Union that church folk too often don't know when to shout. <laughs> Dr. Alexander and I were talking about this back at the hotel. We, we, we shout on trash and get quiet on truth. Church folk too often don't know when to shout. We will applaud ignorance and get appalled with substance. Church folk too often don't know when to shout. We will praise somebody putting on a show while they're singing and fall asleep while the gospel being preached. Church folk too often don't know when to shout. Look, 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 look at these church folk in Luke 15. The text says tax collectors. That's who's coming. You, you know who tax collectors? Tax collectors were people who were hated by the Jews. Tax collectors were considered to be agents of the colonizing government, Uncle Tom's with no regard for their own people. Tax collectors are parallel from the first century to a black drug dealer in the black community in the 21st century, dealing death to his own people, making the enemy richer for a few crumbs, a few pieces of jewelry, an expensive car, some bling bling for himself, but the man getting all the big money these are the folk who are coming to Jesus. These are the folk who are coming along with other sinners to listen to the Lord. These folk who are normally seen as selfish and self-centered were coming to the Savior. Church folk ought to be shouting. But instead, because too often church folk don't know when to shout, instead of shouting, the text says they what? They grumbling. Oops, touch a neighbor. Say, Reverend just stumbled up on something important. Maybe the reason some church folk don't know when to shout is because they too busy grumbling. Maybe the reason some church folk can't shout or don't shout is because all they know how to do is grumble. Maybe if church folks spend more time shouting because of what the Lord has done for somebody else, they'd have less time to grumble about the stuff they ain't got no business grumbling about in the first place. But here they are, verse 2, grumbling. Here they are, church folk complaining. Here they are, officials of the church, scrutinizing and criticizing the folk who are coming to the Lord. And Jesus when Jesus saw that, Jesus told them three parables, one about a lost sheep, one about a lost coin, and one about a lost son. And I want you to look tonight at the story Jesus told about the lost sheep. Jesus says, which one of you? If you had a hundred sheep and lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Now, please remember, in each of these stories, Jesus is talking about God how God cares about us, how God sees us. God sees us just as valuable as the other sheep, the other nine coins, and the other son. 
a lot of us, when I was a pastor, I heard a lot of people trying to turn this good shepherd story into a model for ministry, and we saw ourselves, or we saw our pastors as the shepherd, but that does violence to what Jesus is saying in the text. Jesus is saying that God is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall know. Jesus is saying, sisters, sisters from Louisville Seminary, you're going to love this. Jesus is saying that God is the woman. who loses a silver coin. And in the third story, that God is the Father who loves prodigiously, patiently, and unconditionally. Look, look what the Lord says in this first story. A sheep. Which one of you, if you had a sheep, who got lost? A sheep, that's us, that's us. A sheep, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. Now turn back and say, a sheep, that's me. Jesus says, a sheep gets lost. Now, two things you've got to remember about this word picture that the Lord Jesus paints in this story. Number one is how a sheep gets lost, and number two, what happens when a sheep does get lost. Now, see, most of you all, even though you're from Louisville, I learned how to say Louisville, Louisville, Louisville. <laughs> most of y'all don't know nothing about no sheep. That she go to the zoo, or you have a petting zoo for your churn. Y'all don't know sheep, but these people that Jesus is talking to, they knew sheep and they understood when he uses that parable and, and that metaphor and that paints that picture, they understood something that you don't know, but I'm fitting to help you. Touch your neighbor and say, he's fitting to help you. Sheep can only see six feet in front of their face. That means the sheep gets lost six feet at a time. She'd be grazing right here and see some grass six feet over here, six feet. I'll start grazing over here a little bit. Oh, then see some more grass and look green over there, six feet. I'll start grazing over here. Oh, some more grass over here looks greener probably singing the whole time he's grazing. Grazing in the grass, grazing in the grass, baby can <laughs> You missed it. We get lost a little bit at a time. A sheep grazes itself away from the flock six feet at a time, and we get lost a little bit at a time. A sheep does not wake up one morning and say, I'm going to try some green pastures I heard about over in Indiana. Sheep can't see that far. Sheep goes astray six feet at a time. A sheep gets lost a little bit at a time. We get lost a little bit at a time. Sometimes it is grazing on a little Bible study at work taught by somebody who can't spell hermeneutics. Six feet. Sometimes it's opening the door to study with the Jehovah Witnesses. You know they're really some nice people. Six feet. Sometimes it's Bates Memorial in the morning, St. Stephen's in the afternoon, and then Louis Farrak in the evening. Six feet. Sometimes it's Walter Malone in the morning, Louis Farrak in the afternoon, the black people. Six feet. Sometimes it's reading a little Bible. No, no systematic Bible study at your own church. I had one member tell me, Betty, she said, I don't need Bible class. I just open the Word of God and wherever it falls, that's what I read for the day. I said, show me. She opened the Word of God and said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. Let me try something else. Try another pattern. Go thou and do likewise, six feet. Six feet. Sometimes it's reading just a little Bible, but then after I read a little Bible, I'm gonna read a little Quran, assalamu alaikum, six feet. Then I read a little Bhagavad Gita. You know, Tina Turner just get married. Did you see that ring Tina Turner got? She did that chunk, hum, rum, rum, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I'll read a little Bhagavad Gita so I can learn a little about Zen Buddhism, six feet. Then I read a little ancient comedic religion, six feet. Then I read a little Rastafarian, six feet. And if I'm gonna read a little Rastafarian, I gotta put a little Bob Marley on, get up, stand up. Stand up, pull your legs. And if I'm gonna read a little Bob, I gotta do a little ganja. <laughs> Six feet, six feet. Sometimes it's listening to a little gossip. 
some barbershop gossip for the brothers, beauty shop gossip for the ladies, nail shop, all I need is tips today, six feet. Sometimes there's no Bible class, no prayer service, no ministry meeting, no meaningfulness. Then I miss a few Sundays here, then I miss a few Sundays there, six feet. Then I miss a few, I'm listening to people tell me, you know that base memorial got too big. I remember we was a small church. Everybody knew everybody, six feet. Sometimes just not telling myself, I just don't feel like getting up, going through all that parking lot. You know when we had a smaller church before the fire, you didn't have no parking lot prop six feet. Sometimes it's something I heard from a reliable source, six feet. Sometimes it's listening to somebody tell me, you know, you don't have to go to church to worship God, six feet. Sometimes it's me confusing the preacher with the one the preacher is preaching about, six feet. Sometimes I get mad at them folks. Somebody hurting my feeling. Yeah, y'all choir sounds good, but you gave my solo to her. You knew that was my solo, six feet, six feet. Sometimes is falling in love with somebody who doesn't believe what I believe, and they really are nice people, and I don't see the harm as long as their heart is right. Plus, they're a whole lot better than all them hypocrites that are up at y'all's church. Now, when you hear the word y'all get in there, they didn't move from six feet to six miles, but they did it a little bit at a time. But then look what happens, Jesus says, when the sheep gets lost. The sheep has no ability to find its way back. It cannot see that far. And here's the first powerful point that Jesus makes about God, the good shepherd. Because you can't find your way back to the shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord comes looking for you. Jesus says God goes after the one that is lost and God keeps on looking until he finds it. I don't know who it is tonight at Bates Memorial, but somebody, somebody here is so lost you haven't been able to find your way back. Because sometimes, and Jesus, remember, is talking to sinners also, sometimes it is sin that pulls us away a little bit at a time. We, we try one little sin and it bothers us the first time, but the next time it doesn't bother us quite as much, and then the next time it bothers us even less, and the next time we hardly notice it, then after a while, not only don't we see anything wrong with it, we can now justify it and argue with the folk who are trying to tell us we're hurting ourselves. We look up and we find that we're so lost, we give up trying to find our way back. But look what Jesus says, the Lord is looking for you tonight. The Lord has come looking for you tonight. And the Lord won't give up until the Lord finds you. Now somebody, I heard you when you thought it. You just thought to yourself, I know he ain't talking about me. Because I'm in a church on a Tuesday night. I could have been at home in my bed getting my swerve on because Shaquita and Junebug ain't going to nobody's church no how. He ain't talking about me because I'm in the house. Say, I'm in the house. I'm in the house. That's why I didn't let Doc stop, Dr. Mumford stop at verse 7 where the story ends. I wanted her to read verse 8 because I wanted you to hear verse 8. Look at verse 8 if you still got your Bibles open. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. It says, which one of you, like the woman who loses a coin, what does she do? She lights a lamp and then does what? Say that again. Say that again. You can be in the house and still be lost. But the Lord won't give up looking for you until the Lord finds you. Somebody I'm talking to you know. The Lord is talking to you tonight. The Lord, the good shepherd, has left the 99 and is looking for you. Now, a lot of people, because of them church folk, in verse 2, a lot of folk run from the church because they don't want to hear a lecture. And church folk are quick to give you a lecture. When you did it wrong, you get a lecture. Try some drugs, get a lecture. Had a baby out of wedlock, got a lecture. Had two babies out of wedlock, here come two lectures. <laughs> Slipped, stumbled, fell down, another lecture. Wallowed in the mud, straight away, lecture. But with church folk, we'll give you a lecture. Please look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. The good shepherd doesn't give you a lecture. The good shepherd gives you a lift. He not only looks for you. Say looks for you. He lifts you. Look at it. Look at it. He lifts you up. He lays you on it. You see, he knows you're too weak to try to make it all the way back by yourself. He not only looks for you, he lifts you up. The Lord wants to lift somebody up tonight at Bates 
Lamori, I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. And more importantly, the Lord knows who you are. He doesn't want to hurt you. He just wants to help you. He doesn't want to lay you out. He wants to lift you up. Dr. Frederick G. Sampson, one of my primary mentors in ministry, formerly the pastor of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. He went on to be with the Lord the same year my daddy died, 2001. Dr. Sampson made this point come alive for us at Trinity Church in Chicago when he came about 25 years ago. Now, Dr. Sampson taught us, he, first of all, he teased us. He, he said we were the booby prize in Chicago because he loved doing revivals on the West Coast and on the East Coast. On the West Coast, he had the Pacific Ocean. On the East Coast, he had the Atlantic Ocean. And every morning, he liked to be out when the sun came peeping up over the water, over the horizon, so that he could watch God paint the sea, paint the water, paint the sky with beautiful colors and a brand new day. And he and God all by themselves would just commune together. He said we were the booby prize because we didn't have the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. We had Lake Michigan. <laughs> well, he'd go out walking by Lake Michigan in the morning. And one morning he said he was out doing his morning devotion, waiting for the sun. And just as the sun came up, he saw a crane playing with a fish. The crane had caught the fish standing right on the edge of the seashore. And every time enough water would come in for the fish to swim to safety, the crane would pick it up in his mouth. When the water would recede, he dropped it, flip, flop, flip, flop, flip, flop, flop. Water come in again, he pick it back up. Water recede, flip, flop, flip, flop. Just having fun. Didn't mean no harm. Get me to have some breakfast. The crane didn't know what any of you who've ever been to the seashore knows, which is when you stand on the seashore, every wave that comes in pulls your feet down into the sand. You know that. The crane didn't know that. The crane just having no fun. Flip flop, flip flop, flip flop. When the crane got tired of the game, the crane swallowed the fish. and tried to get up out of that sand, but he was trapped, he was stuck. Not a problem. Dr. Samson said, I will help this crane. Now, those of you who didn't know Dr. Samson, in fact, he's from down here in Kentucky. He's the 6'5", 320 pounds, big black guy goes over to help this crane. The crane took that sharp bill, beak of his, and cut Dr. Samson's hands from an amazing grace to a floating opportunity. <laughs> His hands were bleeding, and he said, I wish I could speak crane. Because <laughs> if I could speak crane, I could explain that I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm just trying to. Somebody just missed it. Tell you, maybe you missed it. You missed it. Some of us were playing on the seashore of life. We didn't mean no harm. You're a genie in the sky, full of wonder and surprise. Venture by you're the one that I've been waiting for forever. And Had a little fun. Today I saw somebody who looked just like you. She looked like you do. I thought it was you. As she turned the corner, I called. Was it you? Was it you? 
Brother man, brother man, what, 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 brother man, what? She's married. <laughs> Me and Mrs. Mrs. these two young ladies all night long. I just lost them with all them OG songs. But this is how y'all get stuck. But you do bad, but you do good, but you do stuff that you can't wish you could. When you get alone, I might have to do it. Just like that and do it like a certified track. You want to put your name on it? Awesome. You want to put your name on it? You know you want it. Black or long. Y'all get just as stuck as we get. And the Good Shepherd will send Pastor Bruce by, he'll send Dean by, he'll send President Jenkins by, he'll send the deacon from the church by, and just like that crane cut Dr. Sampson's hands, his friend, he will get out of my business. And God said, I wish I could speak man. Because if I could speak man, I, wait a minute, I can speak man. Pulled off his robe in glory. Rode through 42 generations of the prophet to put on a man robe. Walked the dusty roads of Galilee. Climbed up Calvary's hill so he could speak man and help us to understand I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm just trying to... Now, I'm through, I'm gonna leave y'all alone, I'm through. There's one more thing I want you to look at the text, look at the text. Because what Jesus says next is what only the good shepherd can do. A frightened sheep, what does verse five say he does? He picks him up, he lifts him up, lays him where? Look at that picture he just painted. The frightened sheep, heart is racing. Can only see six feet, so every sound he hears is a potential threat. But when the shepherd puts him on his shoulder, the sheep's heart is next to the shepherd's heart. And the shepherd knows that he's loved. He not only looks for you, he not only lifts you up, he loves you back to the throne. And with the shepherd's heart beating softly and steadily, the sheep knows that he's safe in the arms of the shepherd. Are you safe tonight in the shepherd's arms? Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. I'm safe in his arms. He lifts me, rest in the meadows green, he leaves me beside the quiet stream. He restores my failing health, helps me to do what honors him the most. That's why I'm, that's why I'm, that's why I'm in his arms. Come on. Every head bowed, every eye closes. The Bates Choir ministers to us. Because the Lord is my shepherd.